So when we're younger, we've had this question, how do we live life to the fullest and live life with no regrets? There is a plan that's taught in the education system and in our communities. This plan says, do good in high school, get good marks, and if you get good marks, you get to go to university and get more good marks. And if you get good marks, you'll graduate and you get a good job. And if you get a good job, you get a house, and then you have arrived. You have one life. Or you get a house and a car, and then you're worthy of being married. And then you get a wife, and then you live happily ever after at age 27. Remember I said, who's 33 years old? Because this story of what success is or live life to the fullest, it runs out of gas. And I would wish that everybody actually fulfills, comes to the end of this chapter very soon in their life. So they can see that there's more to life than this. There's more to life than getting a house. There's more to life than just getting a car and just getting a job. Because now what happens after that? What happens when the person hits their 30s? They got the job, but they don't really like their boss and they don't really like that person, this person. And they're just kind of not happy. It might not even be the job they kind of like. And then you got married. I won't say anything about the marriage, but I'll talk about the cars. You got this car. I always marvel at the cars. They look so shiny in the dealerships. But give it five days after you bought it, it's not so shiny. Especially with this winter, all the salt throwing on it. It's quickly rusted down and you're like, SubhanAllah, this was my dream like last week. And now it's happened to the car. So you've arrived at this point, maybe like you're in your 30s, early 30s, and then an alarm clock starts hitting. And this is the amazing thing about sadness. A lot of people try to shut off that alarm, try to press a snooze button on that sadness alarm. What that alarm is telling you is Allah created you for more than this. There's more that you need to do. But what people try doing in the sadness is pressing this alarm, uh, the snooze button. And yeah, you snooze for about three months. And then the sadness kind of creeps up on, you. what am I doing with money? And you press the snooze button again for another three months. But then the sadness, as the years go by, the snooze button doesn't work as, as effectively as it did before. Then the sadness hits. And, and what I'm talking about is like universal human experience. Because the human being cannot go through life with no purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that we have a higher purpose. And the body won't let the person just go through life, just eating and drinking and just moving on like that. So then the time comes. Here I'm going to give you what Islam teaches about this. And this isn't necessarily something that you're just going to open up a book and it's going to find it. I, I had to search for this and go through my own years of trying to discover. So what I'm going to be telling you about is something that you should take note of. I'm going to give you five pearls. The first of those pearls, how to live life to the fullest and with no regrets. Here's pearl number one. You open up the pearl, you open up this clam, this oyster, and inside you see this first pearl. And the pearl says, understand that Salah is your life's number one priority. The Prophet ﷺ said, the first thing, أَوَّلُ مَا يُسْأَلُ عَنْهُ الْعَبْدُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ الصَّلَةِ the Prophet ﷺ said, the first thing the slave of Allah will be asked on the day of resurrection is as salah So if you're preparing your life not for retirement, but you're preparing your life for this life and the next, for both, and you know that the first thing that you're going to be asked about is your salah, then that's your number one priority. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, um, there's actually some two narrations of it. One of them says, فَإِن صَلُحَتْ That if his salah is correct, all of his actions will be correct. And if it's not correct, the salah, then all of his actions after that will not be correct. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, that if Allah accepts this person's salah, Allah will accept the other deeds. And if Allah does not accept the person's salah, then the other deeds will not be accepted. All the success in your life is found in your du'a and in your soul. All your life success, including your house, including your spouse, including your good job, including your happiness, including you know your children getting good mark. Every single good thing in your life is in your salah and in your du'a. It's right there. This is like the incubator of everything in your life. Now I say that, and you see a lot of people go to their prayer, it doesn't seem like this is the case. And if you look at people who do that, they're not making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do their salah, they come in, come out, salam alaykum, salam alaykum, and then they're back to work or just trying to make ends meet. But they're not actually going into their salah as if it is this incubator and with the power of du'a. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
in one of the surahs, it's in Surah al muzammil Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it said to the people of hellfire, what caused you to be in hellfire? What got you to this location? And they say, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ They say, number one, that we were never one of those people who did our salah. Salah wasn't part of our lives. In another verse, Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, successful are the believers. And their number one characteristic, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who have khushu' in their salah. They're concentrating and they're putting their heart into their prayer. The first characteristics of ultimate success. We're not talking about like a, a small dunya success, but we're talking about dunya and akhirah success. That the first of those gems is that salah is going to be, has to be your number one priority. Number two pearl. So you crack open that oyster and you're looking at the number two pearl to live life to the fullest with no regrets. This pearl says that your career doesn't matter. Everybody frets about their career. What am I going to study? What does Allah want me to study? This degree or that, Allah, what do you want? So pearl number two, that your career does not matter. What does matter though? There is a career that you absolutely must have in order to live life to the fullest and to live with no regrets. That is the career of Abdullah and Amatullah. To live your life with the career of being the servant of Allah then you have no regrets. Does anybody go to Jannah, look back at the dunya and say, man, I wish I had studied something different in university. There's no regrets. But somebody in hellfire might, might say something like that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So whether somebody becomes a doctor or engineer, or they open up a store, or you know, they, somebody drives a taxi cab, or somebody owns a bookshop, or whatever it is, the whole community, all of these things are needed. And it makes no difference what you do. All of that is a livelihood. Inshallah ta'ala, you get rewarded for providing for your family, alhamdulillah, halal income, that's fine. But in the grand scheme of things, living life to the fullest, no regrets, it does not have anything to do with your career. It has all to do with living your life worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Living your life as Abdullah, or living your life as Amatullah. Number three, life will throw at you some hard times and some good times. You basically have two things thrown at you, happy times or difficult times. So some of you are in happy times, even though you might be frowning and stuff like that, I understand. And sometimes there's just a plateau, nothing's really moving. But if nothing's really moving, something's coming very soon. It's either going to be happy or it's going to be sad. If you're not doing anything about it, it's probably going to be sad. The Prophet ﷺ taught us how to face this, right? How to face the ups and how to face the downs. And then if you do this, and I would say that telling you how to do it is different than you actually mastering it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Amazing is the affair of the believer or the life of the believer. So amazing in my language, so awesome. The life of the believer, everything that happens to a believer is khair for that person, is khair, is better for them. Prophet ﷺ said, if something difficult happens to the believer, they're patient and it's better for them. If something good happens to the believer, they're thankful and it's better for them. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَذَلِكَ لَا يَكُونُ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ And this is only for the believer. Meaning that it's something that you train, it's iman that you work on to be able to be patient and to be able to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So oyster number three, face life with sabr or shukr. Sabr means patience and shukr means thankful. A fourth oyster is prioritize your regrets from now. So if you look back at yesterday, what do you regret from yesterday? You can answer the question yourself, but if you look back, you might regret that number one, that you might not have paid full attention in your salah. You might regret certain good deeds that you, know, you didn't really do that you hoped you had done. You might regret not spending some time with family, right? You might regret, maybe if your parents are in the old age, maybe you weren't as nice to them as you could have been. Or you didn't really take the opportunity to show your love to them in the past day. And that's just yesterday. What do you regret? Now, what about the past week? I know if you've been in university, it's very easy to say, well, I regret not reading you know, uh, the homework. Now I have to cram for it. I regret this. I regret that. What do you regret in the past week? 
and then you work your way backwards, if you were to say one year, in the past year, what do you regret? And a lot of those things will be projects that you wished you had done, you never did it. Some ideas that you had that you never really executed on in the past year. And I won't say the past decade, um, what you regret. Maybe you're still young and 10 years ago is a long time. But if you start making that list, things that you wish you had done, and start prioritizing it, what do you really regret? And you make your own list of really the things that you regret in the past day, in the past week, in the past year, or longer than that. And now, once you do that thing, moving forward, you have a list of how to live your life. Moving forward after that, you now have a list of how to live your life. So the things that you regret, so it could be, for example, that you wrote down, well, I regret not being kinder to my parents. And now today you realize I have the opportunity to be kind to my parents. If yesterday you regretted or the week that I didn't read as much Quran as I wanted to read, now you have the opportunity to read the Quran that you want to read. If you have, you know, kind of like this goal to be more present in the masjid and do your salah better, you now have something to do for today and tomorrow. Let me go to the masjid, let me pray. And then anytime you ask yourself, what should I do with my life? Prioritizing your regrets now gives you the way forward. And finally, the last oyster. The oyster says that Allah controls the world and not you. The reason I say this is that a lot of people they act as if the whole world can be changed by themselves. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you see in the Quran Allah azza wa jal says, in alayka illa al that the only thing you're responsible for is to pass on the message. Even when Ibrahim alayhi wa was told to call the people for hajj, and Ibrahim alayhi wa said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him call the people for hajj. Adhim fin nasi fil hajj. Ibrahim alayhi wa responds saying, how can my voice reach them? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's not your responsibility for your voice to reach them. It's your responsibility to pass on the message. And Ibrahim alayhi wa called the people to hajj until today, you know, thousands of years later, people are still answering that call and the voice reaches. And I'm saying this one from my own experience working in the da'wah. The analogy that I give for it, that you're not in control, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control and the power is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. The analogy that I give is like a train. This train and Allah's deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pushing the train forward. You know, how many people became Muslim it has nothing to do with us, right? And every time somebody becomes Muslim, ask them, where did you learn about Islam? From a book that somebody wrote 50, 60 years ago that they found in the library or they looked it up. They themselves are searching for the truth, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen moves forward and I wish that there were better, you know, um, people leading in that train. But the train will go forward regardless. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen and the world is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. There was once a little boy, had a grandmother and his grandmother was really good at the game of Monopoly. And she used to beat her grandson in this game of Monopoly and he used to get beaten really badly. So after one summer of being beaten really badly, he decided that year, in that upcoming year, to get really good at the game. You know, in the next summer when he goes and visits his grandma and so on, he's like, I'm gonna spend the whole year playing this game, playing this game, getting really good at the game, and so on. So the, the next year came along, and they went to visit the grandmother. And this boy, you know, one year older, lays out the Monopoly board game, and he says, bring it on. You know, left, right, Park Avenue, this, that, buying the hotels. And basically, after purchase after purchase, this boy destroyed his grandmother, crushed her. And so as he was, you know, finishing off the game and, you know, and his grandmother was going bankrupt and, and it was coming to the end, the grandmother had one last move. And with it, she won the game. As the game came to a conclusion, she said, my dear son, even though you've won all of these things, at the end of the game, everything goes back into the box. After everything you've accumulated, and all the toys and gadgets and houses and cars, everything goes back into a little box. So there's nothing really to win in this dunya, because it's all going back into the box. Sooner or later, it's all going to go back into the box. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you'll win at this game of life. And inshallah ta'ala, your focus won't be here, but it'll be on the dunya and the akhirah prioritizing your salah, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that being your focal point. And from there, all khair and all goodness can come to you inshallah ta'ala.